Thanks, yeah, and, and thanks, Owen. Uh, an absolute pleasure to be here with you all tonight. Uh, thanks a million for the invite. Um, my relationship with Ireland goes back over a decade now from the first few times that we uh, we started to, to go across really um, while I was working at Sports Coach UK at the time. Um, and I've always found uh, Irish coaches to be one of the most informed uh, and one of the most um, that really that they want to get better all the time. So uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to to play uh, a small part in that in that journey for some of you today. Uh, I guess the first thing that I wanted to do is is to re-emphasize um, what Jerry was saying about about my background. Really, um, I am kind of a researcher by accident. Really, um, really, what I, if you ask me what my identity is? If if someone was to ask me what's your identity, it's not really a, a researcher. That kind of is something that I enjoy doing, and it's, it's a great gig, uh, and it pays the bills, really. It pays the mortgage, um, but my identity really is as a coach. So whenever I, um, whenever I try to, to do any research, uh, most of the time I'm, I'm looking for something that is going to help me uh, improve my coaching. Um, and, and in that sense, really, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I can, I can make compatible the idea of coaching, and I've coached from little kids to, to internationals with the idea of, of researching and teaching. Um, but like I said, I still keep a very selfish kind of approach where I, I, I'm really interested in things that hopefully are going to make me better as a coach. And, and that's where this project came about. But before I really tell you a bit more about the project, um, I want to really do an experiment with you. And you're going to have to trust me, OK? Because I'm a doctor. So we're going to have a blind origami competition. And I've never done this online. And I think some of you may have seen me do this in the past, OK, if you were in Limerick a couple of years ago. Uh, but I think it's really pertinent that we do this today. So what I need you to do is to try and get a piece of paper like this, OK, if you can. It could be any size, all right? And I'm going to give you um, five, 10 seconds to get the paper ready, OK? And then. I'm going to give you some instructions, but you're going to have to follow the instructions with your eyes closed. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna do some origami, but you're gonna have your eyes closed. All right, five seconds. Okay, I'm gonna assume that you all have a piece of paper. Okay, and I want you to. I'm gonna. You either can close your eyes, or I'm gonna keep the, the sheet of paper down here. But I want you to fold it in half. Okay, so the first step is that we're going to fold the piece of paper in half. Okay, everybody got it? Fold it in half. Okay, and now I want you to tear off a piece of the paper from the top. So kind of make a hole at the top of the paper. Okay. Okay, so you should be taking off a piece of the, uh, the paper. And I want you to fold it again, okay? Fold it in half again. Okay, and now I want you to take off, to rip off the top right corner of the paper. Okay, top right corner of the paper. Okay. And now we're gonna fold it in half one last time. Okay. And we're gonna take off again the top right corner. Okay. All right. And now I want you to unfold the paper. Unfold it and see what you have. Okay. And mine looks like this. Okay. But I can guarantee you that all of yours will look different. I mean, there might be maybe, I mean, there's nearly 300 of us, I, I believe. So probably there'll be three or four that are similar, but all of them will be different. So what is the point that I'm trying to make? Look, today I'm going to be giving you a lot of information, okay, based on a, on a research study that I, I did a, a few years ago. Um, but I'm not going to give you any, any recipes, okay, because I'm going to be giving you all the same information, but you have to really interpret that information to come up with your own piece of paper really because uh, what we know from this re uh, from these research which we uh, we did with a lot of uh, very successful coaches is that they're all different okay they're all very different uh, yes they have some commonalities uh, but how that is manifested in 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 the day-to-day 
is slightly different because they coach different people, they coach different sports, they have different personalities. Um, so all I'm going to say is give you, um, I'm going to try and give you some principles for you to see how these apply or could apply to your coaching. But please don't feel like you have to apply everything straight away or don't try to copy and paste because it doesn't work like that. Uh, from the things that I'm going to tell you tonight, there'll be some things that maybe fall into that blue part of the circle, which you go, yeah, that's me. Okay, that, that's 100% what I do already. Some of them might fall into the green part of the circle, which is, yeah, that's who I want to be, but I'm not quite there yet. And some of them might fall in the yellow part of the circle, which is, no, that's not for me. That's not who I am. Okay, that's not going to work for me or that's not going to work in my context. And that's perfectly fine. So, so please just make sure that while content is important, I'm going to give you some content, uh, the way you interpret that content in your context is way more important, okay? No recipes, no copy-paste, you know, make it your own, take whatever, whatever works for you uh, and, and drop the rest, okay? So who are we talking about, really? Um, we were very fortunate uh, that between the, uh, the London and the Rio games, we were able to interview 17 what we call serial winning coaches. And these coaches are coaches that have not just won one major trophy or one gold medal at the Olympics or the Europeans uh, or the World Championships. Um, these are coaches that have repeatedly won gold medals over a long period of time with different athletes or with different teams or with diff in different countries. Okay, so these are people that over a 30 year period have done nothing but winning. Okay, and this is a very small group. When we actually put the first list together, we, we could only find 31 coaches that match the criteria. Uh, and of those, we were able to actually get 17 to sign up for the study. So let me just give you a quick example of, um, of three coaches that were in the sample. So the first one of them was Jelko Obradovic, he's a Serbian coach who has won the EuroLeague, which is the, uh, the, the basketball equivalent of the Champions League, nine times with four different teams, okay, and in four different countries. So this is a, a big time winner. He's also won a, a, world, uh, a world championship um, and, an, and a, an Olympic silver, I think. Um, then we had someone like Markus Weiss, a German three-time Olympic gold in field hockey. Uh, but very interestingly, he won twice with the men and one once with the women. So again, that that's a, a very interesting interesting coach there. So we had seventeen people like this, like these two. Now I'm going to ask you a question, uh, and this is where you're gonna uh, I'm I'm going to ask you to start typing on the chat. Okay. So if we think about this serial, what a serial winning coach is, someone that has won repeatedly for a sustained period of time, who would those be in the context of GAA? So can you think of names of coaches that would fit that criteria in GAA? Okay, and if you can, please throw them in the chat box, okay? Okay, so, Owen, help me here. Are they gonna put them in the Q&A or in the, there yeah. should be a chat box somewhere as well, yeah? In the chat at the bottom there, Sergio. So they have yeah. Gavin, Sean Boylan, Jim McGuinness. Oh, I can see it now, yeah, yeah. Okay, oh, lots of names coming in. Excellent. So, Jim, Gavin, Jim Beginner, Brian Cody. Okay, I think I had quite a few of those in the next picture. Okay. Now, interestingly about that picture, um, I'm gonna tell you what I found it interesting, okay? Jim McGuinness, I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw what he looked like as a, as a player. Okay, he's like, like the Irish brother of Michael Bolton. That hair is unbelievable. Okay, I don't know what happened to that hair, but Jim, if you're watching, you need to grow it back. Okay, but anyway, these, these guys are the, um, the pinnacle of GAA. Okay, and, and they would have been, and I was uh, speaking to Owen a couple of days ago, that it would be lovely to, to replicate this study in, in a GAA context. Um, so that's, that's one for the future, hopefully. Now, um, when we think about these coaches, um, we need to understand that actually, uh, although, and, and you know this because you're all coaches, but people that don't coach, people that just watch a sport on TV or, or at the weekend when they see their children play, 
uh, they think that coaching is easy. And particularly coaching at a high level, they think that uh, that, that coaching is just a, a life of a traveling around and in a life of luxury from hotel to hotel, visiting countries and, and it's anything but, okay? Uh, we know, um, and, I, and I've been fortunate enough that to experience this firsthand, really, when, when I coach the um, Team GB, uh, it's no life, okay? You spend your life out of a suitcase um, and, and, and it is a difficult life. It is great and it's what we all want and, and we, we dream of, of being in that position, really. Uh, but it is a it is a tough life. It's not it's not a jolly. Okay, so um, can I ask you in the context of GAA again? Uh, and and this could be anything. It doesn't have to be a high level. Okay, some of you might be coaching at the performance level. Some of you may be coaching young children. Um, what are the key features of you know of, of 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 your context that make coaching a challenging job? Why is coaching uh, you know, it's, it's not something that is easy, okay? Or if you find it easy, that's perfect, okay? But what might be the key challenges uh, in coaching in any context, okay? So back to the chat box, and uh, let's see if we can, okay? Yeah, I love it. 25, 30 different characters, egos, having buying from the players, the pressure to win, the fact that you need to be really patient, I love that because I always say that the curse of the coach is that you never know if you've done a good job until 10 or 20 years later, really. Even if you win, that's not that's not the, the main point. Personality, consistency, parents, keeping people focused, dealing with people, not a full-time job, time, empathy, no two players or teams are the same, the behavior, the weather, and then guys, I live in Manchester, you, you live in Ireland, we know all about the weather, um, although my sport is indoors, so I can't complain too much. Um, different levels of ability, motivation. See, interestingly, and, and, and we will get on, onto this through the presentation really, but a lot of the challenges that you are putting on the, uh, on the chat box, they actually don't refer to the sport. There is very little there around teaching the sport or making uh, children or players understand a certain style of play. A lot of this is the, uh, the psychological and the dealing with people and the relationships, right? Uh, or I love this one from Joe that says about balancing work, life and coaching. Okay, fantastic. And that's something that we all go through and it's a really difficult one. And we'll get onto that as well. All right, great, great responses, guys. The chaos, I love that from, I love that from Niall. Perfect, okay, so we're gonna, um, Oh, and we need to save the chat because a lot of those answers really are, are worth revisiting at some point. Uh, yeah. We need to save it. The chat comes in and the reports at the end, Sergio, so yeah, we'll be saving that. Perfect, brilliant. Um, so, okay, so what did we do in the research? So traditionally, uh, coaching research has, has really looked at the, uh, what, what we could call really the tip of the iceberg, really, what's above the water. Um, in, in particular, in high-performance coaching research, we've tended to investigate what we see, the observable behaviors of the coach, what our coach is doing, okay? In our research, we wanted to do something slightly different. We wanted to go on the water and really explore uh, who these people are. So what are their personality traits? What are their motivations? Why do they do what they do? Uh, and also how they do it. And, and what kind of leadership styles really led to this fantastic success to, to this enormous success really so we wanted to go under the water now the first things that we did is we looked at their personality traits and motivations and this is when i have to come clean really because and this is something that all researchers have to accept you never go into a research project with a being a blank canvas because your your own thinking is always um clouded or informed by by your previous experiences or or your own biases okay and, and this was my bias really i don't know if it's because I, i've seen all the, the the american sports movies or or, or all of those things really or, or because of some of the coaches that i had growing up uh, but i thought that the this these serial winning coaches were going to be a cross between count dracula and and the wicked witch of the west uh, that that was my understanding that they were really i didn't think they were going to be nice people um and, and we found completely the opposite if you want. We found, yeah, that some of them still had some of these traits or, or, or that at times they, they could behave a little bit like that. But in the main, we found people that um, that were really at the service of the people they coached 
Um, I didn't mention before, but as part of the research, we also interviewed some of the athletes. So we tried to interview two athletes for every coach. Um, and what we got from, from the athletes particularly is that uh, they weren't like this. They were not Count Dracula and the Wicked Witch. Uh, they were they were much nicer. We didn't find any lone wolves or, or any people that were maladapted or um, any, any any people on, on the extremes, really. Um, and that's important. That's something that, that I'm going to really come around to a little bit. So how did we look at their personality traits? First thing we did is we, we ran something called uh, the five uh, factor inventory. So we look at there's, there's five key areas of personality, really. Um, and this, we, we, we asked them to take a test. And we also had the, uh, the athletes complete the same test, reflecting on the personality of the coaches. So the first factor is neuroticism. Basically, that's about emotional stability. Um, for example, how much you are into uh, conspiracy theories, like everybody's out there to get me, or how do you react when things go wrong? Uh, how do you behave under pressure? Um, again, like how emotionally stable you are. And take a guess. These guys were pretty low in this area. They are they're pretty chilled. They can take things in, in their stride. Uh, they can cope with uncertainty. They can cope with things going wrong. Um, and I really feel that this is a, a, a very significant finding, if you want. It's not rocket science, uh, but it's something that as coaches, we probably should spend more time working on becoming better at this. Okay, Because personality traits are part, partly genetic, but they can also be modified through through hard work. And I think this is one area where we could, me personally, this is one area where I, where I can, uh, that I've been really focusing on, 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 on getting better at this, on, on becoming more emotionally stable, both in, in practices and competition, really. Particularly when I'm coaching at the higher level, at the, with, the, with the kids, I'm, I tend to be okay, but as the stakes get higher, I tend to be a lot more neurotic, okay? And I'm, I'm sure that I'm not the only one. <laughs> The, the second trait is around openness, how, how open you are to new ideas, how open you are to things that are different to what you do, how open you are to, to listening to others, okay? And, and in that sense, these guys came as quite high. So these guys are thirsty for knowledge. Uh, they have a, a very strong uh, way about the way I do things, but they're always, they're always prick their ears when they think something might help them become better. Uh, they're really predators of knowledge, uh, so they're always quite keen to listen to what people have to say. I always, I always tell this a uh, little anecdote. Really, I was very fortunate to uh, to have to introduce Eddie Jones, the uh, the England rugby coach, uh, at a conference, and and that allowed me to spend ten minutes with Eddie Jones in a room before I had to introduce him. And in ten minutes, he was constantly asking me questions. It was, I wanted to really get the, try and, and, and get those golden nuggets from, from Eddie Jones. And he just kept asking questions. And I was thinking, this guy is crazy. What, what can I tell him that, that he doesn't know? Um, but that, that's the kind of guy he was when, uh, in, in, in that moment. Now, the next thing is the uh, being agreeable. That means how, how well do you work with others? And is it my way or the highway? Or, or how well do you take someone else's ideas and mix them with your ideas? And, and here there was a little bit more disparity between the coaches. Some of them were pretty high on this. Some of them were quite low. Some of them were quite happy to, to really um, to make decisions by committee or to, to consult people that were making decisions. Some others just were, no, um, we're doing it like this. Okay, so there was something in the middle. The fourth one is extroversion, really. So this is more about how socially competent you are. Okay, how comfortable you are in social situations. And what came up here again, it was a bit of a mix. Okay, uh, in, in, it was a mix in the sense of a, none of them were the heart and soul of the party. None of them were the super joker that is always, you know, cracking jokes and, and making people feel uh, like they're in a, in a comedy show, right? Uh, they alternated really. Um, but what they were all uh, very competent with is, is dealing with you know, being comfortable in social situations. Some of them were more quiet than others. Some of them were a bit more lively. But in reality, what, what the athletes were telling us a lot of the times is that they were quite good with people. But it doesn't mean that you have to be a joker or... or and that's important because I think sometimes we've got this stereo, stereotype of 
the the coach, the great coach, uh, this charismatic, um, uh, you know, a bit like like Klopp. Okay, the, I put that picture there on purpose. Not every great coach has to be like Klopp. Okay, and plenty of coaches in the sample, you know, they 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 don't really match that Klopp uh, profile of being lively and always smiling and always having the the right word and the right joke at the right time. They, they, you don't have to be like that. So if you're not like that, don't worry. Okay. Um, and finally, conscientiousness. This is basically about hard work. How hard do you work? And, and what we know from this research really is that these guys work pretty hard. Okay. Now, interestingly, uh, because as, as I said to you, we ran the questionnaire with the coaches and also with the athletes. This was one of the only areas where there was a disagreement because the coaches said, I work hard. And the athletes said, the coach works very hard. And I found that really interesting because typically, uh, and again, this is me and my neuroticism. Uh, I sometimes think that the, co the uh, sometimes I've thought in the past, uh, I've kind of got away from that now, that the players didn't appreciate how hard we were working as coaches, but actually they do. They, they really do. Um, and that was really clear in, in this research that they, uh, you know, the hard work of the coach didn't go unappreciated by the, um, by the athletes. All right, so that's, that's their personality traits. The next thing we wanted to look at was, um, and by the way, sorry, before I move on, as we go through the presentation, really, um, as, I said, as I was saying to you, perhaps all I want you to do is to reflect as we go through on, on where you sit uh, in, in this spectrum of ideas, really. And that's where the research has been really important for me over the last few years. I just constantly use it as a, as a reference point to analyze how well I'm doing um, in, in my, my own ideal of how I want to be as a coach or the coach I want to be. I've taken some of these ideas, incorporated them, and, and then I can rate myself or rate my performance against all of these things, okay? So what about motivation then? We gave them again a, a, couple, of, uh, a couple of tests, and, and mainly we came out, it came down to two things really. First, we wanted to see uh, what kind of approach they have to, to life and to problem solving, okay? And it was clear. Um, in life, really, normally there are two types of people. People that are, are kind of the bull by the horns people, what we call a, an approach uh, mentality, and people that are more, more head under the sand, an avoidance mentality. Uh, and guess what? These guys are very, very strong on, on the bull by the horns. They, they don't really let things simmer. They don't leave, you know, when there is a problem, they, they address it really straight away. Uh, they don't let things fester. They just really, they're straight in there. The, uh, the problem solvers really uh, and, and, and I think that's important again because a lot of the times we tend to procrastinate and, and, and let problems grow bigger than they, than they really are um, and what these guys did was they just nipped it in the butt straight away okay now the other side of motivation was okay so are these coaches uh, in it for themselves or are they in it for others so I'm going to ask you a question now and I'm going to uh, refer you back to the chat uh, all you have to answer is for me or for others. You know, where do you think these coaches are in the for me category or the for others? Okay. Answers are coming through. A lot of everybody's advice for others. Very good. Me and others. Cormac, Middle, Darak, me and others. Okay, both. And, and, and really, I set you up with the question, really. I asked the question in a, in a very leading way based on what I said before. Uh, they're actually banging the middle or, or in a way, rather than banging the middle, the two are not exclusive of each other. So a coach can be very for me, but also can be very, very for others. And that's kind of what we found with the majority of these coaches. They had a real drive to be, to win for themselves. They hated losing. And they had a, a I'll mention this again later, but they had a patholo pathological desire to win. They needed to win for a number of reasons, really, uh, which I will come on to later. But at the same time, they, they balanced that with a real desire to, to help others achieve their dreams uh, and a real sense of responsibility for that. And that seems to be one of the keys, really, that, that balance of you can do both, OK, 
Okay, you don't have to feel guilty if you want to win for yourself because it feels good to you and it's something that you that you want to do. Um, but that, that kind of more selfish mentality, to call it something, um, can be balanced with the, 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 the very altruistic point of view of, I also want my athletes to do very well, okay? And some days I'll be more on the for me and some days I might be more on the for others, but it's that balance that, that really gets it to work. Um, and we're gonna come back to this idea of the, the balance the, the whole session. Okay, so when you put together the different personality traits and personality profiles and their motivations, that gives you a, a particular type of person, okay? If you wanna composite uh, a Frankenstein of, a, of, of what a coach looks like really at this level or, or this kind of coach. And I'm gonna give you some points really here. From what we know, just with the um, with the with the personality profiles, really, the, these coaches have a very clear vision and a very clear focus. They know what they want and they know how they want to do it. Okay. At the same time, they're very focused on the future. They don't dwell on the past. They only look back to learn. They don't look back to to feel sorry for themselves or or, or to just to to ruminate things okay it's always about what do i do next what do we need to do to keep moving forward and in that sense they're very optimistic okay these guys are optimist they it's always um the glass is always half full with these guys and and they can do that because they're emotionally pretty stable you know there's nothing really their own um that they can they can self-regulate their emotions so it never goes out of hand and they, they're able to have a, a relatively objective view of what's happening and be able to move forward. And that also allows them to be go-getters. So they don't wait for things to happen to them. They 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 are the, the say their own catalyst. They make things happen. Okay. They're very good students. They they really spend time studying studying the, the sport. Uh, we found that they like a lot reading things from outside sport and they like talking to people from outside sport as well. And they take a lot of pride in working hard. Okay. Um, regardless of the result, they they they're very comfortable. Like I say, they hate winning. So they hate losing, right? But if they feel they've done everything they could have done, they're okay with that, and and they take pride in in, in ticking all the boxes, really. So what I'm going to show you next, I might have to. I'm going to stop sharing and share again because I don't think I clicked on the on the sound uh, on the sound box, and I need you to hear the uh, the because I'm going to play you a video. Okay, so just bear with me a second. I share again. There we go. Okay, I hope that works. And I'm gonna play you a video. Because I'm gonna play you a video of, of two coaches, <laughs> rare footage of two coaches in a shopping mall that wouldn't really fit the profile of a serial winning coach, okay? Tell me on the, in the chat box if you can hear the sound. Whoa, that's not good. Oh, I don't need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello? There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now, would somebody please do something? Help! 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 <laughs> I don't believe this. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. <laughs> well, there's not enough left to do. That's it. Hello? Hey, don't worry about it. I'll fix it in a second. <laughs> he said he could fix it. <laughs> All right. All right. That's more like it. He says he can fix it. Okay, I love that video um, because we all have escalators that we get stuck on. 
and and sometimes we uh, we we just sit there waiting for someone else to fix the problem really. And I play this video to my players. I play it to my students. I play this video to myself when I when I feel like I'm stuck um, somewhere, just feeling sorry for myself. And that is something again that. Uh, really summarizes the attitude of these guys. Okay, uh, right. We're going to move on, and, and the next thing on the uh, to, on the iceberg is the idea of values and beliefs. Sorry, sir. Okay. Just, yep. There's a there's a grey box um, kind of showing on the uh, yeah, just where you're hovering over now. Yeah. If you want to go back out, unshare your screen, then uh, reshare it again, but start again. If that makes sense from the slide that you're on. Okay, so let me. You want me to? Uh, let me uh, let me stop uh, the PowerPoint as well and yeah. restart it as well. Okay, so okay, that's what you want me to do. Let me. And should be okay then from that slide there. How is that? That's you know, Am I back on track? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So the next thing we want to look at is the idea of values and beliefs. Okay. Uh, because obviously after personality and dispositions, the motivations, uh, there's something really important, which is our philosophy, our personal philosophy on life. Okay. So again, back to you, quick question for you. What do you think are the key values and beliefs that are common amongst GAA coaches? And again, this is a really broad question uh, because all of you will be coaching at different levels uh, and there might be different values at different levels of competition. But just have a go and show me on the, um, on the chat what you think are the, um, the key values, really. And they could be positive, they could be negative, okay? If you find that there's any, any negative values uh, in the system, I've already spoken to uh, Jer and, and Owen about that. It's okay if, if something... It's negative as well. Okay, so the idea of winning at all cost. Okay, there's plenty of good values, but there's also that kind of uh, winning sometimes may take priority. Love of the game, developing people and skills, very passionate coaches. My my perception when I've been in, in Ireland with you guys is definitely very similar to this. Keeping the tradition alive, trust, respect, integrity. Constant improvement as a national culture. Perfectionism. That's Troy, that he's one of my basketball fellows. Pride in the local place. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so what did we find in the um, in the serial winners? Because we actually saw some um, can you see the screen okay by the way? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, because we found uh, some some surprises here, okay? Uh, now, back to my, my point about thinking that these guys were going to be a little bit like Count Dracula, we found the opposite. They, they have a very high moral stance. So, as you were saying in the chat box, trust, respect, integrity, honesty, uh, they came first. And again, that was really reiterated by the, uh, by the athletes. Uh, these guys were trustworthy. You could trust them. And that's related to the fact that this, the second point in, the, in their values and beliefs, in their philosophy, was that the athletes was the compass. They were very athlete-centered. They, they were always trying to do things for the benefit of the athlete, as opposed to their own benefit. And, and in a way, it's a, um, a, a catch-22, really, or chicken or egg. If I do good for the athlete, then the athlete does good for me, and we both win. Okay, and bear in mind, I think one of the significant things is that these guys were able to sustain performance over time. You might be able to win while being a really bad person if you want, but that won't be sustainable because the athletes won't, won't want to play for you anymore. But these guys were winning for 30 years or, or even more. Okay, and the surprise came here. We really did, weren't expecting these guys to have a, a, a work life balance, and they prioritized that. They really felt that that was important. Having said that, they were always very clear that work-life balance is a relative thing. It's not the same for you as a coach uh, than, than someone that works in an office nine to five. Okay? And they were, they were accepting of that, really. Uh, but they felt that you still had to make an effort to, to find work-life balance. 
and that was a bit of a surprise okay and they also felt that they needed to to have a a, a bit of work-life balance and sorry uh, to encourage the athletes to also have uh, the right work-life balance so that was a bit of a surprise but uh, a very welcome one though the next thing we looked at was the day-to-day -day. what do these guys do on a day-to-day -day? so uh, how do they spend their time and and we saw that their day-to-day uh, informed by this philosophy of you know the athletes first and and and, and being uh, you know very honest and very respectful revolved around three three key areas vision people and environment so just quickly they had a vision that they like i said they really knew what they wanted to do and, and how they wanted to achieve it uh, but they knew that they needed to get the right people um on the bus so to speak uh, to be able to realize that vision but more importantly they knew that they need to put that those people in the right environment and that combination of vision people and environment the thing that they spend the whole time going back to to really if those three things were in the right place they things were going to work out or had a had a higher chance of working out now let's break them down a little bit so in terms of vision uh, it was really important for them that they knew where they were going uh, and they knew exactly the kind of performance they wanted to achieve and that that performance were future proof because we're going to make you win today, it's not going to make you win next year or the year after. A very very clear example there was um, a, a very famous coach uh, that has won an, Oli got an Olympic gold at every Olympic Games since 1972, okay? And he's the only one to have done that, so I've just given him away there. Um, but he basically said, uh, I interviewed him after London, and, and he told me straight away, we know that in Rio, if we want to win another gold medal, we have to do a race five seconds faster and lo and behold and he told me on the 16th of august 2016 at 3 p.m we need to go five seconds faster and i don't know yet how i'm going to do this but we need to find five seconds somewhere boom uh, fast forward four years and they won in rio and they they ran um five seconds faster okay now obviously that in in a, in a sport like like this one which is a very um physiological sport if you want it's a time it's a race is a little bit easier or maybe a little bit easier than when you when you are coaching a, a team sport where where the the variety of uh, factors and and players and systems is, is, is a lot higher okay but it's this idea of what does the future look like um and, and how do we get there now similarly uh that future looks complex okay performance is a very complex thing so what these guys were very good at is what we call simplexity they were able to really simplify that complexity uh, because uh, if you try to, there's, there's, there's a million things that you could affect, but if you try and do them all, uh, you end up doing none. So they really were able to, to focus on the things that are gonna give you the, the biggest return on investment and they, and they really just hammer those. Uh, and then obviously it's just a case of once you know where you're going and what your priorities are, you, you action plan and you constantly review and adjust. And, and in some cases really what we got from the athlete is that, they were constantly reviewing, it was painful, that they were debriefing every single day and, and that they were really, uh, really accurate on, on, on this idea of reviewing. What about people? The coaches were very strong on, on selecting the right people, uh, both in terms of the, uh, the staff and, and the players. They, they always said that the biggest reason why they were successful, uh, or a lot of them said that, um, is because they had managed to, to bring together the best group of people possible that, that with that group of people would have been very difficult to lose okay so so team and staff selection are very important and it's not always the best players but the players that are going to work the best together uh, and they, they really emphasize that uh, a lot then the, the second thing really around people is that they, they spend a lot of time developing the belief um, they were hard on people but at the same time they were constantly really going out of their way to make people uh, believe in themselves uh, believe in the coach uh, and then believe in, in, in the work that we can all do together, the coach and the athletes. And they had different strategies to do that. We, we, we don't have time to go into it, but, but they really spent time and went out of their way to develop that belief. Uh, and then finally, they really spent a lot of time uh, managing the, uh, the, the high performance team. These guys were with teams that are, you know, in excess of 30 or 40 people between strength and conditioning, doctors, physios, uh, nutritionists, sports psychologists, uh, video analysts, a lot of people really. So, so they really had to learn to, 
to manage that people appropriately. Okay, and, and that, that takes time and accepting that that's part of the job was initially tough, they, they told us, um, but then they realized that was a fundamental part of the job. And then finally, the idea of the environment, okay, and, and how to create an environment where, where high performance is just inevitable. Not winning, because it's impossible to predict winning, okay, but how to create an environment where you're giving yourself the strongest possible chance of winning, okay, and that starts with high expectations. Um, for me, it was really, uh, I was lucky that I, I, I went into a lot of these places to interview the coaches and straight away when you walk into these places, you see that there's a culture of, of high standards, really high expectations and that everybody's behaving in a particular way. There, there's, there's no, if you behave differently, you don't, you don't last very long in these places. Okay. Now, coupled with that, there's a question, there's a, uh, an environment where there's incredible, an incredible amount of challenge, but also a, a substantial amount of support. You're not you're not left to to sink or swim. You're supporting in that process, um, and and the coaches felt that that was really important, and particularly the athletes, because um, at the end of the day, the athletes are people, and that that was another big thing for us through the study. That um, realizing that no matter how good they are, uh, these are still people, and these are still young people, uh, which is even more important. So you have to challenge them, but you also have to support them to create this kind of greenhouse effect. Where everybody feels protected and everybody feels like they can, they can grow really. And in part of doing that was this idea of the uh, the no stone unturned, where the coaches really went out of their way and and the staff to find little advantages here and there. Um, when you know what we talk about sometimes this idea of the marginal gains, they were very into that. Uh, but also when they explained that, they also said, but don't stop doing the basics, okay? Don't don't go down a rabbit hole to find a one percenter and, and, and forget the other 95% that you need to do as, as the basics. And finally, that number five there for me, the managing upwards was a, a big realization because I realized that I, I did that very poorly. And I think I've got a lot better at doing that. Um, that means as coaches, we are very comfortable managing down. That is telling assistant coaches and staff, uh, sorry, and players what to do. But we've been poor traditionally managing up in terms of influencing the club chairman or the club president or even the federation, really. Uh, and these coaches went really out of their way to, to actually get their points across to, to the right people. So they really spent time um, uh, managing upwards, really. And that's something that I, I hadn't really thought about that much until, until we did the study. Okay, so that's the, uh, the day today. Now, uh, when you put all of this together, uh, we kind of came with the idea, okay, we, so what does this mean from a, from a leadership point of view? How do these guys lead? And the best way we found to describe how they lead is this idea of driven benevolence. And, and it's, this, it's defined in, the, in, in this slide here. Uh, and I'm gonna let you read it quickly, and then I'll, re I'll repeat it. So driven benevolence is the relentless pursuit of excellence, but carefully balanced with a genuine and compassionate desire to support athletes and more importantly, support yourself. Okay, so the, uh, these guys are tough. They want to win. They have, a, like I say, a pathological desire to win. And they are very perfectionistic and they'll do anything it takes. But at the same time, they have a counterpoint, uh, a balance of uh, they're actually quite genuine and compassionate with the athletes. They really look at them as people. So let's break this down quickly. What does it mean to be driven and benevolent? In terms of being driven, as we've said, and wearing high standards, a real high sense of purpose and duty, like doing this means something bigger than myself. I mean, the, the, the biggest example I can tell you is I interviewed one of the, uh, a, a British coach, okay? Uh, and he was very funny. Uh, he was old school. Um, and at some point he, uh, when I asked him about, why do you need to win so bad? You know what he did? He actually pulled out a five pound note okay uh, with the image of the queen okay and he said because i work for her that that was his drive okay and that's extreme right um but he felt that he actually he worked for the queen which is amazing really in 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 his own mind that was his motivation okay but other people held other motivations they could be their country or they could be a sense of duty to the athletes okay so there was another coach that mentioned that um, he just felt really responsible for the athletes that the athletes normally only have one shot at winning something big uh, whereas as a coach, you've got a, a shot every year kind of thing. Um, and, and they really um, they really enjoy that, that idea of 
have got a duty uh, of care to the athlete. As I said to you, they have a pathological desire to win. The, the, the main thing I can give you here is a lot of them have been, out of the 17, 14 had been international athletes themselves, but only two had actually won a medal at, a, at, a, at an international tournament, at the Olympics, basically. So they all had unfinished business. They needed to win because they needed to make amends for, for what they didn't achieve as an athlete. Um, and, and then another characteristic of the drivenness is they're all in. Once they commit to coaching and to a course of action, nothing takes them away from that. Okay, it's, it's, it's all or nothing. There's no, there's no middle ground. And finally, in terms of being driven, and we've talked about this, this idea of 2020 vision, where they're very focused on the, on the future. What do I need to do? What do we need to do in the future? Or how, how are we going to win? But also very focused on, okay, how do, how do I translate that picture of the future into today? Okay, what do I need to do today and tomorrow and the day after to get to that picture? So that's the driven side. The benevolent side is very, very easy, really. It's about people. Okay, they put people first all the time. Okay, like I say, that doesn't mean that they are easy going or, or push over. They're very tough, but they know where, where the red lines are, really. Uh, and they always seek to understand the athlete. If you're going to really push these athletes really hard, um, beyond the limits of what a human being is capable of doing, you need to really understand the athlete and why they do it uh, or why they don't want to do it. And I would really recommend you, there's a new documentary on Amazon about Carolina Marin, the Spanish badminton player, and the relationship between Carolina and her coach is amazing. Um, and I've been very lucky to meet them both uh, through, through another research study that we did a few years ago please watch it. If you want to see a, a real relationship between a, a, a coach and an athlete and how a coach can be driven and benevolent at the same time, please watch it. Uh, really worth a watch. And finally, this idea of being benevolent is about being benevolent to yourself as well. And, and in these cases, this idea of, yeah, a lot of things are going to go wrong when, when you're coaching, particularly at the high level. But don't, don't let yourself die Okay, really, there's always another day. The sun is always going to rise the following day. So that, that's kind of the, uh, the, the summary of the, the leadership style. Now, again, the next step is, what are the advantages of, of this leadership style, of, of this personality and motivation, these values and beliefs, this philosophy, the day-to-day -day and, and the driven benevolence? We felt that the advantage was that there was a lot of cognitive and emotional flexibility. Okay, so what does that mean? I'm going to skip the question because we're running a bit out of time. I'm going to just tell you straight away. What does it mean to be cognitive, cognitively flexible? First, that you actually can behave like a chameleon. That as a coach, what you need to do is to change your color, change your spots, depending on the athlete and the situation you're in. And try to be a different, try to be the right coach you need to be every day. And sometimes that might be a real, I'm going to swear, a real asshole on a given day and the next day you might need to be their best friend but you need to um, you need to be able to change your color as as needed okay and please bear in mind these are um these are people coaching in the elite if you're coaching kids you never need to be an asshole okay apologies for my french again but um now creative solutions you need to be able to one thing that is going to happen in coaching is that things are always going to go pear shape okay no matter how much you plan something's going to go wrong so being creative in solving problems is really important. And this uh, cognitive flexibility allows you to do that. It also allows you to be self-aware and to have a lot of self-control. And that, that to me, that was, an, again, another realization. These guys were so self-aware. They knew exactly who they were and they knew exactly what they did. And it was really clear because when they were explaining what they did and how they behaved, and when the players were explaining it, it was very similar. There were, they were very, very few... Um, discrepancies between players and coaches and that allows them to learn really quick and again I think there's an old saying that says that the, our biggest competitive competitive advantage is to be able to learn faster than the opposition so these guys were very good at that i think now in terms of emotional flexibility okay uh, I, like i said they were very emotionally stable so they actually enjoyed the roller coaster they embraced the uncertainty and and the pressure of of of, of being in high high performance sport that allowed them to live another day like i said they never feel too low to quit uh, and, and allows them to to carry on and they were very happy to be compassionate to others and to to oneself 
And again, that doesn't make them soft. They are the opposite of soft, okay? I promise you. Um, but they were they knew where the lines were, where the red lines were. And that really allowed these guys to have adaptable coaching behaviors. Okay, so that's that's what, what we felt was under the water. So I'm gonna just leave you with one final reflection, okay, in terms of who these guys really are. And basically they they came in, in two types. Some of them were a bit like Indiana Jones, okay. And I'm conscious that some of the younger people in the audience might not know Indiana Jones, okay? Go watch it. But really, they were the righteous Avenger. They were a little selfish, with a need to prove themselves. But at heart, they were really good people, fighting for the right cause, and ready to die for everybody else at the top of a hat, literally, okay? And on the other, some of the coaches were a bit more like Gandhi. So what we call the higher purpose altruist. Always about the greater good, always ready to, to commit personal sacrifices, always fighting for the right cause, but at the same time, having a steady determination. These guys are not soft, okay? So you might want to take five seconds to think about where you are, you know, who, who, which one of the two are you? Let's go back to the chat for a second, to the, to the chat box, and quickly show me who do you think you are, Indiana Jones or, or Gandhi? Just write that on the chat. Indiana or Gandhi, who do you think you are? Peter both, yeah. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Rambo. <laughs> Brilliant. Dr. Jones, not just Indiana Jones. I absolutely love it. Indiana all day long. I'm, I'm, I have to say, I think I'm more Indiana myself. Okay. Um, brilliant. Okay. Both have to be combined. Absolutely. But again, I, I, although they have to be combined, I think some, some of the coaches lean more one way than the other. But what we, um, what I didn't tell you is that we found a third character in there that, that we hadn't seen before really. Uh, and is that whether, whether you were Indiana Jones or Gandhi, all of them had somewhere there uh, sometimes a little bit hidden, but they all had another character there that we call the Homer Simpson, okay? The realist, okay? The one that keeps them on the ground and the one that really understands that shit happens and, and that really you need to find a way to get some me time to be able to um, to really cope with this and, and, and last the distance, okay? Because coaching is a marathon, not a sprint, okay? And on that note, I'm going to finish the presentation just by encouraging you to find your homer and find your donuts and your beer and and that will make you a, a better coach and allow you to carry on coaching for for the rest of your life okay so i hope you enjoyed it uh and thank you so much and i'm ready for questions when you are so just if you can unshare your screen there just so everyone can see you absolutely and jerry's just going to come in and ask you the first question Okay, and um, thanks very much, Sergio. That was uh, really fantastic. Um, so our first question is um, from Endo, Endo Garman. And Endo would like to, to ask you, Sergio, just advice for getting players to buy into your process and to believe in the system and then what actions you can do to achieve this. Yeah, yeah parents are, are always a, an interesting um, situation, really. I think... Uh, for me, there are two things really. One is you have to be very clear and very honest with the parents. To me, it's communication, uh, and that's where you start really. We we make a big, big play of of meeting with parents all the time, um, because particularly if you're working with with children um, at any level, really. Uh, but if you're working with children, you need to appreciate that parents are really invested. Okay, I don't think I really appreciated that until I had my own children. Um, uh, I'm going to show you, because I've got it here. Uh, so this little figurine of Bob the Builder, okay? This thing traveled the world with me when I was coaching Team GB, because my, my first son was born when I was doing that. Uh, and as soon as he was born, I realized, actually, all these players that I coach are someone else's child, okay? Uh, and I took that with me to remind me of that, um, that, that I should never forget that. Um, and I've kept it ever since. Uh, now, in terms of... How do we do it? Communication. We, in two ways, really, in, in, in helping them 
I always say that when you when you coaching you you have to accept that you're also coaching the parents. Parents don't do anything. Parents don't do anything detrimental to their kids or to you on purpose. They 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 really want to help. They want the best, but they, they sometimes don't really know what that is. So we really meet with them a lot. We we let them have their say. We explain to them our, our philosophy. For example, in my coaching, I have a, a I try to do a lot of coaching uh, or delegate a lot of the coaching on the players. I put a lot of responsibility on the players to do stuff. So, for example, when something from an early age, okay, for, I do this with eight year olds and I do this with twenty year olds. Um, if something is not quite working. I will really hold back in terms of intervening straight away to allow the kids to solve it by themselves. So for the coaches, for the parents, when they are watching this, they may feel that I'm not coaching, that I'm just letting the kids run riot. Uh, so I will meet, I will always meet with the parents at the beginning of the season and explain, this is how I coach, okay? And this is why I do this. So when you see me do this, this is why I'm doing it. So to me, the, the, the biggest thing with, Parents is always um, engagement and, and communication. If they understand what you're trying to do and, and who you are, a lot of the problems disappear, okay? And if you take time to get to know them as well, um, because every every family is a different a different world. So it goes back to this idea of managing the, uh, the team and the entourage. Uh, again, it's something that at, at times is difficult to accept and, and it's time consuming, very time consuming, okay? Um, but you ha if you invest in in that, you will you will get lots of benefits back. Class, thank you. Uh, next question from Cormac Doherty. How important is loyalty among fellow colleagues in your sport or your club? And should a coach keep a small number of people in his or her circle, or try to reach out to as many people as possible? Um, that's a great question, really. Um, I don't know if I can give you a definitive answer there, really. I think it depends a little bit on, on who you are as well. But for you, oh. yeah, what I what I can what I can tell you is um, both in terms of what, what we saw in the research and also what we what I've experienced in my own personal life as a coach. Uh, if you when you find the assistant coach that you really work with well you want to keep them close to you as much as you can, okay? Unless they want to become a head coach themselves, okay? Uh, but really when you, I, I, in fact, I've, I've kind of moved away from referring to people as assistant coaches. That I just call them co-coaches because we, we we really try to be at the same level. Uh, so I know that, um, look, an important element of coaching is building relationships, okay? You can really build skills or, 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 or transfer knowledge until you've got a relationship. If you are a coach going to a new club and you have to start building relationship with the coaches there, that's going to have an impact on your ability to, to have an impact on the players because you're going to have to build their relationships with the staff first before you can have an impact on the players. So that's why I understand that coaches at a certain level, they travel with an entourage, okay? Uh, like Mourinho goes to Tottenham now and, and brings every everybody with him, the, the strength and conditioning coach, the doctor, you know, all, all that. Uh, because it is important to to have that trust. At the same time, I'm a really big advocate of, of always trying to leave a legacy behind. Okay, of of really like uh, I think, for example, Guardiola is a big example of this. Wherever he's gone, he's really left a legacy behind. Okay, because it takes time to to educate people within the club. He brings people with him, but also takes people in. Uh, and I think it's a it's a balance really. Um, I think it's good to have people that you can trust, but it's also important to to constantly try to broaden your group. And in and for example, in my sport in basketball in the UK, I think we're very guilty of of being very protective of our of our own little turf. Uh, and I think that's changing really. Uh, and I know Troy, one of the coaches, really is, is on the on the webinar. Um, and Troy and 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 a new generation of coaches in in Troy's age group are really building together. Whereas probably my generation were kind of building against each other. Um, and these guys are having Zoom calls like this between themselves. Uh, they're sharing everything they do and learning from each other. And, and, and I think that's the only way. And I wish my generation had been a bit more like that. Okay, uh, thanks very much for that. Um, I have a question here from, from, 
from Oren, and he asked a question around philosophy and vision. So, Sergio, he wants to find out how do you find your vision or your philosophy? And, you know, there's a lot of material out there, and it's sometimes hard to know where the right route to go down. Yeah, uh, great question again. Uh, uh, for me, it really starts with this idea of, um, of values. You know, where are, where are your key values? What do you, what do you, how do you think, um, how do you think life works? So do you, uh, what, what, what is important to you? And it might be that what's important to you is, is relationships, is hard work, is honesty, is, is helping others, is, or it might be that your values are more around, no, it's win at all costs, and, and you just have to understand who you are, okay? I'm not saying that one set of values is better than another, okay, that's not my job. I'm saying you need to understand what your values are. Because whether you want it or not, those values are going to inform your behaviors. And, and it's no good thinking that you are one way and then behaving in a different way. You need to either, you need to be really clear about, for example, in my, in my case, I've had to work very hard to really understand who I am, to then make sure that the demand of myself, that the way I behave matches those values of beha and behaviors of, of who I want to be. Because they don't always do. Okay, because sometimes what, from what we say to what we do, there's a big gap. Um, and I think it's important that, that we really take time to reflect on, you know, who do I want to be? What do I value in life? So, for example, again, another personal example, because I think that's important really to, to share with, the, with the, the, the colleagues that this is personal experience as well as the research. Okay, um, I realized at some point that I, I valued my family too much that if I kept going down the, the idea of being a professional coach, there was a high risk because of the situation in my particular sport uh, um, that I was going to lose my family or become estranged to my family, okay? Because uh, I was never home, literally, okay? And I thought, i got to stop that. That's not who I want to be, okay? So I'm going to coach at a, a different level or coach less or... Uh, and you have to know who you are and who you want to be, um, and that's an extreme example, really. The idea of it's between the sport and my family, and some coaches are quite comfortable to keep going that way, uh, and that's fine. Like I say, I'm, I'm not here to judge anybody. It's, it's, it's really what works for you. But you have to sit down and, and think about it. And for example, there are you can download from the internet lists, lists of values, really, and you, you, you have a hundred values, and you start selecting. Select the 10 that apply most to you. And then from those 10, select the top three that apply to you. Kind of those exercises to really put you in the ballpark of, of who you are and, and just reflect a lot. Reflect, a, a, we, we always talk about self-reflection as a, as a big, big thing. Um, just spending time thinking, what happened today? Is that who I wanna be? What, what would I like to happen differently tomorrow? Uh, and ask people about you as well, you know, who do you think I am? What do you think I stand for? This idea of the 360 degree feedback. Uh, we do that with the parents. We, uh, we have a, an online form that we send around for them to tell us anonymously what they think about us. Um, and I think that, that all those sources of information from self-reflection to feedback from others are really important to understand who you are. Thanks, thank you. The next question is going to be a few questions there. We, we could go on for another hour in this, but I'm going to ask one then, Jerry, and then we're going to finish up. Um, so, Sergio, the next question is from Stefan Derry. Uh, there's a lot of research out there on so, uh, self-determination theory and motivational climate, climates, such as the All Blacks case study by Hodge. Did you find these coaches to be autonomy supportive and was there evidence of any shared leadership in place? Yeah. Um, yes, they are. Uh, uh, particularly, there were some cases in the sample. Um, so, for example, we, we talked about Marcus Weiss, the, the German coach. Um, he was one coach that was very much into that, into that idea of shared leadership to the point that when he took over the uh, national team for the first year, it was very dysfunctional because that national team was used to another coach that everything was command, everything do as I say. And for the first year, they just couldn't handle the responsibility and the fact that, that this guy was handing over to them a lot of the, uh, the autonomy to make decisions and to decide which kind of team they wanted to be. Right? Um, but like I say, it's, it's a balance. Right? These guys have um, are happy to take opinions for the players, will always listen to the players and take things on board, but at the same time, they have a really strong view about how they want to do things. Um, so don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that these guys are 
they, they don't tend to make decisions by committee, but they will listen to everybody and, and they will be fair. That, that, that word fair came back from the players all the time. Like, for example, typical quote, well, he doesn't always do things that please me, but we feel that he's always being fair, that he's considerate, that he's always thinking about the impact of whatever decision he makes on everybody else. Um, so, yeah, they, they, I think self-determination theory applies to these coaches, but also bear in mind that, mm -hmm. in my view, self-determination theory is not really being studied with super elite performers, okay? In the sense of a, um, it's a theory that is a global theory for humankind, if you want, but the people that we're dealing with here are a very, very specific set of humans, both the coaches and the athletes. These are very special people. Um, these are people that can can overcome challenges that for the rest of us, for the mere mortals, are impossible uh, in terms of disappointments or levels of hard work. Or, so, yeah, it's a real fine. I mean, again, go back to watching this documentary between Carolina Marin and, and her coach, the, the, the badminton player, uh, the coach is Fernando Rivas fascinating really in that sense in that balance between player-led coach-led challenge support um yeah we are real picture of driven benevolence i just finished watching it watching it this week uh, I, i'm gonna watch it again <laughs> okay thanks sergio and uh, i'm going to hit you with the last question but i'm actually going to roll the three into one in, fair, in fairness to the and i know you're good sergio so you'll have no problem uh giving us your your uh, your insights into them so in fairness to both kevin niall and troy i'm i'm calling these the three c's so they're yeah. asking a question around communication credibility yeah. and clear advice and the, and the first one is around how do you deliver bad news so that's on communication uh, the credibility is around how do you prove your worth possibly if you weren't much of a player yourself or maybe you didn't play to a high level and the third one is around one piece of advice that you would give to young players so sorry for the three and one but uh, you're at the, the trinity on this one okay how long do we have uh, <laughs> uh, delivering bad news um to me there are two elements to that really um if you have to if the bad news are a surprise to anybody then probably you haven't done your job properly before that because uh, to me i think what, what what i think these guys seem to do well and what i've been trying to do well over the last few years is there are very clear criteria for how we make decisions as to playing time or team selection or things like that or behavior the, the expectations that we have on people um, and we also make a, a big effort on on helping players self-evaluate. So I think pretty much everybody knows where they stand. Okay, so when, when you deliver bad news, they, they you can justify them because you've got a clear set of criteria and and they shouldn't be really surprises. Really, I mean, either because people should see the writing on the wall because they should understand performance, uh, but also because you, um, I, I, I mean, for example, I'm, I work with a, with a bunch of 15 and 16 year olds. Okay, so really we, we don't deliver many bad news because we don't believe in bad news at that age. Okay, we try to, but at times you have to justify certain decisions. Okay, um, and we try to preempt them really. We, we never, if we know that at some point we're going to have to make a tough decision. So for example, in our sport, only 12 can play. Okay, in a particular game. And I run a squad of 18. So I, I, I really try to, to, put that in advance to people, that they understand that we're going to have to be making those, those decisions every weekend, that we're going to try and be fair, that we make decisions based on this and that, that we're going to try and be fair to everybody. So it's, it's how do you prepare for that, really? But the thing that really, when, when players were taught, asked um, about bad news and coping with bad news is, they need to feel that the coach is being honest. Um, they don't, players don't like to be to, to receive BS from coaches they need you need to be honest and and players need to be able to see that you've you got a justification for making that decision okay and i know that some coaches really don't don't like that some coaches work on they, uh, they don't want to justify the decisions to a player because if they have to justify every decision they make it becomes never ending but i think there are certain choices you have to to make that that, that you probably sh should justify really and and you should 
pave the way for those decisions really so that's one uh, but it's not not easy to do um in terms of the credibility um i think the the biggest thing i've seen with these guys is um is hard work in terms of credibility they uh, to be fair a lot of them were Just really work their backsides off, uh, and 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 all of them work really hard. So, the typical reaction from the players was always, um, the the coach is always first on side, last to leave. Okay, and and I think that's all you can do. Uh, you can just work hard and and hopefully try and get. Uh, it helps really when, when you can win something early. Okay, so a lot of these coaches were able to win something early that, that bought them a little bit of credibility. Um, but maybe, I mean, there were two or three of those that uh, actually took them nearly 15 years to win their first medal. And they had to build really slowly to, to their first medal. And after that, they, they, they won more consistently. Um, but it's just about, I, I think credibility is about working hard and, and really about being a good person. I think if people can trust you, uh, they believe you um but again that's uh, i'm not being very scientific that that's that's more my my personal opinion uh, that people have to trust you if they don't trust you then they're not going to believe you and the final uh clear advice for young players uh, from 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 me to young players or for from from me to people coaching young players or what what's the question there for um, what advice would you give a young player so I think it's you the coach to a player yeah um, well I can tell you what we uh, so for example we going back to the idea of communicating with parents uh, and players we've just gone into lockdown in the UK uh, so we've gone from being able to to train every every day um, to now we're going back online and doing zoom sessions so uh, we, as soon as we went to lockdown, we had a Zoom meeting with all the parents to explain the plans for the next four weeks of lockdown, uh, to really communicate with them. And, and part of that was really advice to the players. Really, So advice, we always say the same thing. Um, you have to enjoy what you do. <laughs> if you find yourself not enjoying the, not enjoying the hard work of your sport, um, either the coach is really bad or or you're not really you can you're not really cut for high performance and that's fine you know the, the, again it's not always the coach's fault you know some for some children as they get into the 14 15 16 years of age the idea of training four times a week and having to do individual workouts at home like my kids are doing now so we've got a, a homework a, a, a homework program really where because we can get together they're doing um they're, they're having to work running they're having to do technical work on their on their backyard and um, that's not for everybody um and, and you have to accept that um so you no know, no if you really what what do you want to get from if you're working at a high performance at a performance development level with with young players it's really helping them you have to work with them to to get them to understand what it really means to be a performance athlete and again, it's not all or nothing from day one because they're 14 and 15, but it's really educating them about how do you make yourself better? What does, what does it feel like, really? So advice is enjoy it. If you're not enjoying it, try and find out why um, and know yourself. I, I, I say that all the time. Know yourself both in terms of what you like doing and know yourself what you're good at and really play to your strengths and know yourself what you're not so good at and, and see if you can work on getting better at it we we place a lot of responsibility on on players self-evaluating and to give you an example we're very fortunate uh, in the club that i coach we we own the facility so um, normally we co we practice at 6 p.m but the facility is available for the kids from 5 30 p.m or even earlier so we really encourage them to come in at 5 30 p.m and they've got half an hour where they develop their own personal development plans with with our supervision but it's down to them they got 30 minutes to work on whatever they need or they want um, and that's something that we emphasize a lot the idea of you have to learn to make yourself better if you're only um 
just to, long story short, but to, to really answer your question, best advice for a young a young player is uh, if you're only going to get better the two hours that you are with your coach, you are wasting a lot of hours where you could still be getting better. Getting better by watching games, by analyzing your game, by doing extra workouts, by resting properly, by eating properly. Um, so, yeah. Absolutely. Hey guys, that's that's the end of the webinar. And um, just a few things. I'll be sending out a feedback form to everybody just to get feedback from Sergio's excellent presentation as well as to improve things going forward. And um, our next webinar link will go up this Friday with Nick Winkleman on the 30th of November. Um, and keep engaging on social media, dub GA webinars, as well as serial winning coaches hashtag. Finally, guys, huge thanks to all of you for joining us and especially to Sergio for his time, his fantastic presentation and his engagement throughout and his family is on... Find your homer. <laughs> Find your homer. Find your homer. And um, again, guys, this is a, um, a personal webinar for me. I have Sergio as my supervisor PhD. I've known him for 10 years. And again, I've learned something new about him, about his research, but also about his coaching as well. So hope you all enjoyed it. Again, I'll be sent in feedback. And again, Sergio, thank you so much for everything and you as well. Thank you, guys. Thank you for, for having me. Really enjoyed it. All the best to everyone. Thanks very much, Sergio. Thank you.